Hello everyone, very special treat today. I was hinting at it in the past couple of videos, but I finally have the footage. I am editing it right now and I'm very excited to show it to you guys. This is a very special interview with Chris and Mark. They felt really, really bad about how bad that mobile demo went and they wanted to make it up to me and give me an opportunity to, you know, get something worthwhile for traveling down to XLCon 4. And uh, yeah, this was a very special treat for me. I am honestly giddy to share it with you guys. At midnight, Bex sent me a message. Hey, how do you feel about coming to the office tomorrow and interviewing Chris and Mark? And this was midnight. And she said, how about at noon tomorrow? And obviously I said yes, but also I was obviously very nervous. And you'll notice that at the beginning of the video, beginning of the interview, I was, uh, I was pretty nervous. So please give me a little bit of a slack there. I had less than 12 hours to prepare, you know, including sleep in there as well. I went to the office at about 1130, kind of got oriented, talked to them a little bit. And then we just sat down and started talking. So caveat with this interview, this is not me trying to sit down and hit them with the hard hitting questions that everyone wants to know that, you know, grilling them about, you know, why aren't there Quicksilver Flask and stuff like that. This is me getting an opportunity uh, to sit down with the developers of one of my favorite games and just ask them questions. I, I took this opportunity a lot just to ask the questions that I care about. So if you're familiar with my approach to games and Path of Exile and what I care about, and you're curious about the stuff that I'm curious about, I think you're really going to enjoy the interview. I really love high level game design discussion and in a lot of like the deep lore questions. So there's a lot of that stuff. I also did not interrupt them whatsoever. I let them just talk when I asked a question. I'm going to have timestamps below for individual questions that I asked. So whatever you might care about and what you don't care about, you can totally just like skip through them. For example, I asked Mark about, I think it was about defenses in the game, and he just went off about like hitboxes and everything. And that's a very long section of the video. And I just let him talk. Full caveats there. That's like just what you can expect. The other thing is, it was just three nerds in a room with no audio visual people to help us set anything up. So Chris took his uh, astrophotography camera and he set that up. It ran out of footage halfway through. Uh, luckily, we also put our phones on the couch and we were recording the audio there. Halfway through the interview, unfortunately, the camera ran out of footage. I have some stock PoE2 footage that I'm going to play, but the second half of this is just a podcast. So, you know, put on your headphones, walk around your house and listen, go for a jog or something. So yeah, without further ado, that's what this is. Really enjoyed the interview. I can't thank those guys enough for taking the time out of their day. This was their day off, basically, the day after XLCon. Everyone was exhausted and, you know, it was just basically us in the office. Like almost no one else was there. They gave me the opportunity to just ask them some questions. I really loved it. Without further ado, enjoy. Hello, how's it going everyone? Subtract him here with a post XLCon interview with Chris and Mark. And uh, yeah, we're just going to talk about what happened in XLCon a little bit, get a little reflection there, talk about why we're here, and then I'll try to ask some questions that you guys might be interested in that I get a special opportunity to ask them. So yeah, Chris and Mark, how did the, uh, the event go? God, that was a, a tiring but awesome weekend. Yeah, exhausted but happy. I think um, I signed every surface there was in that venue at the end. <laughs> yeah, what are we going to? Half past, half past midnight? midnight? Yeah. yeah, barely got my car back. Uh, yeah, you got locked in the building. Yeah. But no, it was awesome. Very good yeah. to see everyone. Very good time. Yeah. Looking forward so to So cool to hang out with everyone. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. And uh, can't wait for the next one. Maybe. Perhaps. We're not announcing <laughs> anything today. <laughs> totally understand that. Uh, so, yeah, did anything unexpected happen at the con or any special highlights that you guys want to mention? Well, Mark managed to die during the demo. That was a highlight. It wasn't unexpected. Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it was unplanned, um, but no, no, it, it, the game hard. Yeah, it happened. Um, but yeah, it was interesting to see. There was actually a you, you can see the shift in people's mentality before and after that because before that everything seems a bit more planned. And yeah, there's a plan. And after that, it's like, oh, this is real. This is live. Like they didn't mean for that to happen. And yeah. Some people still didn't believe. They think it was intentional. I, I died on accident. But yes, <laughs> it was real. Um, and it was a difficult game, which I'm sure everyone who played it. Yeah, We play, we play uh, Path of Exile because Ray Class is a tough, unforgiving place. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, yeah, anything else perhaps unexpected? Well, there was, of course, the mobile segment that you were involved in that um, was probably the worst technical hiccup we had. And... Yeah, it's one of those things where you check it beforehand and it works fine. And on the day, there's various technical issues. Like when you have thousands of people on the Wi-Fi, it just ain't going to work how you expect. And yeah, that went terribly from a technical point of view. And so it kind of wrote it off. And 
We felt really bad about this because um, Subtraction traveled all the way over here to get some content to interview us, and we're just really not happy with how the mobile game was portrayed in the interview because of the massive, massive stuttering with gameplay. And so we thought it would be nice to invite him out to the office today when it's quiet here on the day after ExoCon and get in a good discussion about whatever topics you want to talk about. Perfect. So talking about having a mobile game and Path of Exile 1 and 2, has there been any narrative challenges? Have you guys thought about the interplay and connection between those games? And I actually, the, my favorite part about playing the mobile uh, demo was being able to see some of the characters that we know and are familiar with in their younger forms and learning more about that. And that's actually what I wanted the most. And now that we might have three different time periods and locations in, in the world of Rayclast, uh, are there any current plans with that? Or can well, you speak to that at all? An opportunity to talk about the past, the present, and the future. Mm. Path of Exile 2 explores what happens to Rayclast and the greater world after the events that you're currently seeing. And Path of Exile 1 explores the backstory of what led the characters to be how they are. Mm -hmm. this is, it's going to be, I mean, we've got the call of the prequel, the, I guess what you'd call current timeline of POE 1, and of course the future timeline of POE 2. And it's good that there's enough time between each of those to make sure that we have... I don't want to say infinite, but pretty much an infinite amount of time to fill in with content patches for all of those games. And yes, there's going to be a little bit of uh, making sure that every single expansion patch we do for POE 1, that it you know makes sense in the timeline of POE 2 going forward from that point. And same thing with mobile, making sure that it makes sense for POE 1. And so, yeah, it's a little bit of a ripple in the water, so to speak, of, of things. But it, it, there's plenty of time there, and uh, I'm sure will come together pretty well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of ripple in the water, the you know one of the most controversial things is Path of Exile 1 and 2 being totally separate games right now. Um, in terms of philosophical approach and how you guys are going to be dealing with leagues and how you think about the games, uh, should we be thinking of them as... Just, I'm a Path of XL 1 player, I'm a Path of XL 2 player, I love both. Or what kind of player am I and should, what should I be thinking, you know, going into having multiple games now? We definitely want people to play both if possible. If some people prefer one of the games or want to skip one of the leagues, depending on what it is, that's always fine. Path of XL is a game you can pick up and come back to whenever you want to. And the, while, like... I mean, obviously, when you watch the POE2 demo and we're taking care to explain the mechanics and combat stuff in a careful way and it feels a bit slow-paced, while the reality of people playing proper in-game characters is, of course, the speed and combinatorial complexity that we've come to love from Path of Exile, if there are aspects of either game that you prefer, it's a good opportunity to keep playing that one because we're supporting both of them as much as we can in the future. Awesome. From my perspective, I am... But I'm a player too. I, mm -hmm. I played the game before I got hired here. I still play the game every single league, and I am looking forward to playing both, every single league for both of them. And I mean, hopefully that answers enough <laughs> of what I'm looking forward to do and what we're trying to achieve. So, yeah, I mean, I can speak to that demo, that Huntress. That might be my new favorite class in all of Path of Exile. Sorry, Raider, but yeah. The Huntress felt real, real good. More of that. That's that's all I'm asking for. Nice. Um, now, speaking of the split, uh, in terms of one of the other fears is resource allocation between Path of Exile 1 and Path of Exile 2. Is that something that you guys want to comment on right now? I think that Path of Exile 1 will see even more resources allocated to it as Path of Exile 2 nears completion, and there's a few reasons for that. The first one is, when we were working for the last few years, the quiet period where we weren't talking about Path of Exile 2, we had probably over-allocated art resources to Path of Exile 1 in particular. Most of our team is artists. The vast majority of people working for us are artists, as is the nature of AAA game development. And we were producing leagues where every single piece of content was, to some extent, unnecessarily new, because Path of Exile has such a vast library of assets that we can fall back on. And this was slowing down development of Path of Exile 2 quite a lot. It was taking a lot longer than we expected. And so we realized that we needed to make sure most of the artists were working on Path of Exile 2. And we had the Path of Exile 1 team, with a small team of artists primarily consisting of designers and programmers, able to reuse all the stuff we've made and um, and make sure we're coming up with new mechanics that used our existing art in interesting ways. And you'll notice when you look at leagues over the last couple of years, they've been a bit less art-intensive than ones like, say, Heist or Betrayal that involved dozens of characters and crazy new tile sets and so on. And so the environment art team and the monster creation team and so on have been hard at work on Path of Exile 2. 
But that pipeline is going to eventually run out of work to do as the game gets completed. Like, for example, with concept art, where they work out, especially environmental concept art, where they're sketching new areas. I mean, we know what the new areas are for the six acts of Path of Exile 2. At some point, they're going to run out of new areas to work on, in which case they're available for either future Path of Exile 2 expansions or Path of Exile 1 expansions. And so as the teams of Path of Exile 2 gradually get taken off the major production mode they're in at the moment, it's going to free them up to be working on both games. And so we'll probably be seeing quite meaningful Path of Exile 1 expansions that continue to grow, especially once the Path of Exile 1 team, it's not that they're going to be competitive with the Path of Exile 2 team, but they certainly want to pull in good player numbers. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be quite a drive to try to, you know, gently one-up the other game in terms of the amount of awesomeness that we can actually deliver. So we're expecting to see some good stuff. And I'm sure Mark has a unique perspective from the POE2 point of view as well. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a lot of developers working on both. Um, myself like sure i'm not inputting the data for the monsters or anything but i am certainly deciding what they are what they do and for both contexts um and from the art perspective like looking at from just say monsters um and I, I mentioned this at the convention as well at, at one point but something like sanctum uh the bosses in sanctum were taken from poe2 resources like those are like lycia was a monster that was made for poe2 a boss that uh, hadn't found a home in POE2 either yet or uh, as of this current or as of when it was ported. And so we were like, well, let's use it in POE1. And so even then, even though you've got all these artists working on POE2, a lot of them are kind of indirectly working on POE1 because we're using a lot of those assets in, in POE1 as well. And we've been doing this for a very, very long time. And so it's kind of hard to say, you know, how many people are working on this versus that when we're doing that kind of reuse all over the place. Because in the end of the day, like what you end up having is everyone's working on POE1 and everyone's working mm. on POE2 at the same time. It's also worth noting with content reuse, it may seem like a bit of a dirty thing to, you know, intentionally take something and dress it up as something else in the game. It seems lazy or cheap to do so. But it's actually kind of the fabric of how we approach the company. Like back when... Um, I started it with Jonathan and Eric a long time ago. We realized that with the limited amount of funds we had available, we're trying to make a game for 20 times less budget than other studios would. We had to go deep on the content reuse. We had to make sure every asset could be used in as many different ways as possible, like color reskins and resize shapes and chop stuff around and make sure that we could reuse it as much as we could. And this is important as well for action RPGs, where it's all about procedural generation of areas and random monster mods and getting to fight the same thing in 50 different ways and different combinations of leagues and different combinations of mods on it and ways that you're playing and so on. And that means that we have a pipeline set up to be able to make one thing and use it in 20 different ways. And that lets us leverage stuff between the two games um, really well. And so we're internally using POE2 stuff all over the place in POE1 in more subtle ways than Mark's even mentioned here. I mean, the GDC talk... Uh, Path of Exile designed to play forever. Mm. I, I recommend that all the time. So <laughs> very familiar with that. Yeah. Speaking of Sanctum, regarding to that coming back, the number one question on everyone's mind, Original Sin, Winds of Fate, Sandstorm Visage. Can you comment on the uniques yet? Or um, are we bringing those ones back? I believe our current intention is to keep them as they were. Like, we yeah. have no intention to change them. My understanding, last I checked, is that all of the unique relics, at least their rewards, still exist in some form and let you get the same uniques. I haven't double-checked the list myself, but I don't know of any plans to drop any of them. Some of the unique relics had to be rebalanced to make sure the um, you know criteria worked properly, but the intention is the rewards are still available. Excellent. I do know. Andrew was our main uh, game designer on that one, and um, he certainly has a list of things to check with me mm -hmm. just to make sure we're going to go over but of course the big lead up to ExileCon we were we had one of a single mind or I was more so of just trying to get all the demos ready and everything prepared for that so mm. if it's in the list of his things to go over well then I don't know about it yet either and so you know as much as I do but uh, up until here enough we've with no plans to change any of those uniques. Yeah it's certainly our goal to have a wide variety of powerful uniques because Sanctum itself is a valuable thing to find and a valuable thing to run and hard to get through th um, four floors of it and hard to kill Lycera in both forms and therefore getting an appropriately powerful reward is good. And if we were to determine that one of these was too powerful, well, we can just make it harder to get, make Sanctum's harder to get, whatever we need to do. But I'd rather something was, I'd rather that a powerful thing existed in the game as very rare rather than being removed entirely, which is why Headhunter still exists. 
And we've been wearing the shirt. <laughs> Despite all my attempts to change it in the past. <laughs> um, and actually speaking of Sanctum and how it's set up, one of the coolest things that I saw this weekend is that you guys are bringing in some tweaks to Sanctum for defenses actually applying to the resolve mm. loss. And yeah. I thought that was a beautiful, elegant solution to like one of the biggest complaints during Sanctum League was that the meta build, which it has been for a while, thanks Pox, is Righteous Fire, and especially Righteous Fire Juggernaut. And, you know, uh, low DPS, high defense, had a little complaint with that, and this sounds like it's a, a great addressing of that. Um, now for 322, uh, looking at their strategic setup of all of that, very, very excited for it, but I'm a little concerned for us kind of outscaling that and, um, you know, certain specialized builds just being way out of whack. Um, and just like the way that you guys did it with Sanctum and now with the re, the rehash of Sanctum, uh, can you speak to the strategic element and how you're kind of balancing player power versus, you know, using that strategy there? Well, we're okay with people working out what builds work best in Sanctum because it's itemized and you can trade four Sanctums. If you can specialize and just get a pile of Sanctums and run them profitably, that is a way to play Path of Exile. Now, of course, if the build is deemed to be too powerful, we will probably eventually adjust it. You know, we do want to make sure it's balanced and fair. But absolutely, there will be a good way to build characters and a bad way to build characters, which is the same for any of the content in the game. Mm -hmm. And it's worth noting as well that we've... Um, when we've been rebalancing Sanctum, we've taken an opportunity to change monster diversity so you'll be facing a wider variety of threats within the area, so it's a bit less predictable. And this does mean you do have to be a bit of a jack-of-all-trades with regard to the types of monster mods and so on you're encountering. Okay. I certainly found Sanctum to be, at its core, amazing. But the monster diversity was probably my personal problem I had when playing it on the Live Realm. Just the... But too much repetition for my liking. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, we have so many monsters in the game, there's no reason we need to be. And we're talking about reuse of art assets and all mm -hmm. of that. There's no reason we can't be making more of them. So And players love Barch Nemesis, so... I don't know what that word is. I don't know if we're going there. Uh, <laughs> um, and actually, speaking of different archetypes and you know dealing with different content, one of the things I was most impressed with in PoE 2 was the approach to melee and especially building in mobility with a lot of the melee. And it actually felt really, really good Like for one of the first times in Path of Exile in a while, I mean, besides Bone Shatter. Um, like all of the melee that I used between the Huntress and the Warrior, all of the moves felt really mm -hmm. cool because it, it felt like it solved the issue of standing still. And is there any plan in kind of, you know, getting some of that back into Path of Exile 1 and, and kind of, you know, make melee great? We want Path of Exile 1 melee to feel as good as we can. Mm -hmm. And this is tricky because in order to do the Path of Exile 2 thing, we generally need a lot of the Path of Exile 2 um, animations and rigs that come with the new character classes. We are, we would desperately love to make sure that as much of this was in Path of X one as possible. It's just quite a large task to do so because in order to get all of the skills in Path of X one to use them, it basically means redoing them all. And we are selectively doing this for some Path of X two stuff that is from Path of X one. And so we're trying to quantify what work would be involved in improving Path of X one melee in the same way. And you know you can put a dollar value on everything, and the dollar value may be large. And we just have to work out from a resource allocation and a time point of view when and how that's happening. And I understand that, um, especially after the announcements that Exocon players are wanting to know exactly what is the plan for the stuff in Path of Exile One, like pledge to us when each thing is going to be fixed and how. And we understand that that's something that they're wanting to hear. And so we have to work out what's plausible, what's plausible in the short term, what's plausible in the medium term. Um, even if we were able to get to do the very large amount of work to get that stuff into Path of Exile 1, it can't be done before Path of Exile 2 is released. And so there's some things that are long term. And we, in the meantime, would like to make meaningful improvements as much as we can to Melee. And there's things we've just learned to make it better that we haven't yet applied to POE 1 that we can potentially apply. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of scope for improvement there. Like we are, the experiment of making Melee as good as it can be in Path of Exile 2 has now made us experts in doing this. So we mm -hmm. can apply this to Path of Exile 1. They do share a very large amount of the code base and so on still. And Mark very likely has a more accurate understanding of this. Well, it's certainly, yes. I mean, as Chris said, there's a dollar value on everything, but resources are finite, right? I mean, you're talking about large amounts of, we'd have to change every skill or a large amount of them. We would have to 
then re uh, do the same with the effects, the character animations, um, but also the balance ties in with a lot of what goes on there. Like those skills uh, moving at, you know, the way that they move, uh, is it going to hold up in the kind of period one, um, especially when things like travel skills come into play? I mean, a lot of those are teleports and all of that. It feels very uh, uh, responsive, I guess. Whereas like, a lot of the more movements are in POE2 are a lot more subtle and flowy and they have a good flow to them, but they're not, they're very not start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, mm -hmm. which is a lot of what POE1 is. Um, so will that hold up where now you have some stuff ported over or, or re-implemented, re-added and some of it's flowy and some of it's start, stop, maybe it might be fine. But either way, it's a lot of character animating, a lot of rigging, um, uh, because you'd be talking about if we were to take the new characters, put them into POE 1, where you have to re-rig every single armor to them. And that's all well and good. It's easy to say, well, just do it. But like now those people aren't making new content. Yeah, there's They're a lot not of adding stuff to the game. And so then there's a, well, hire more people. Well, I mean, easier said than done. Um, very easy said than done, um, okay. especially the right people. Jobs at grindinggear.com, please yes. apply if you're a world-class animator. <laughs> I mean, we've got a custom engine. These people have to be trained on our engine in order to do that um, and these things. Um, and that balloons out into just a massive, massive resourcing task. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very difficult to know whether or not it can be done, how it should be done, and the, the logistics behind it all is just very, very complex. So but we're going to discuss, see what we can do, because we certainly want that to be the case. It's just a matter of getting all the pieces in the right place at the right time. I can see you guys have thought about Melee a lot. <laughs> it, it is a very large, very large desire of us to make it perfect. We we have felt inadequate for Melee for a number of years. Mm -hmm. You know, When other games have also Melee, we feel embarrassed and we want to be best in class. Like We want their playing catch-up. Like we, we like it when other people are playing catch-up catch up with us. And so that's the situation we want to be in. And then we'll try to reflect as much of that in POE 1 as we can. Awesome. Uh, speaking of a similar thing that's related to Melee, I guess, uh, the current state of defense, actually, it's been kind of a roller coaster over the past couple of years, but I would, for myself personally, defense actually feels in a really cool place. Like, we have so many different options between Fourth Vow, Blood Notch, Doppelgangers. There's so many cool options to become very tanky across basically every sentence in the game. Um, are you guys really happy with where defense is right now? Uh, it, you know, it's obviously always a continual conversation and things are changing. And is that influencing the way that you're thinking about defense? And I've heard some things, I don't know, I don't want to like lead the question here, but I've heard some things about defense in PoE 2 as well, being very different, uh, the approach to it and the plan there. And, uh, you know, what's the interplay between, you know, PoE 1 and 2 and how you guys are thinking about defense right now? Um, I would say in PoE 1, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Again, there's always the, the small things and, um, you know, there's the whole, you know, everyone running grace determination kind of situations and all of that. And you could, you could argue one way or the other, whether or not these are good things or bad things. Um, you know, I'm sure these things will be continue to be balanced as for, um, here we two and how they differ. Um, I wouldn't say they're fundamentally different. Um, you know, you still have the, the three core defenses. Um, you still have life. There is one thing which I will note. We have, we told some people, but there is no life on the tree in POE 2. Okay. And I know that's not a, de you know, defense, but it is your effective life pool. Right. It's your life pool, not your effective life pool. It is your life pool. Um, and, uh, this means investing in the in the alternate. You instead of now having this whole kind of I need to get 150% increased life, 200% increased life. You have this kind of like minimum standard you need to hit. You now are, are investing even more passives into these really interesting uh, other defensive mechanics. You know whatever they are. Or, you know they are. I mean there's obviously the armor, the evasion, energy shield, suppression, and all that. And we are going to try and make sure there are a lot more interesting situational and conditional defenses for different situations that you're investing in because it's just more fun to do that. Um, life is life. <laughs> and if we just assume that everyone's life is 
what it is. You get it from level, you get it from gear, and you kind of have this just upward trend of life going through the game, and you balance monster damage corresponding to that, plus all the defensive axes, then um, you've just now made the passive tree just far more interesting mm. because you're not just going, well, 5% life, 5% life, 5% life, 5% life. Um, you now have a lot more going on and you could be like, okay, I want to get some of this defense and then now I'm going to get this thing and this thing. It just yeah, broadens up the choices a lot. This is an interesting one because when I first heard about it, I really strongly disliked it. You know, to the point where I call a meeting of, hey guys, I don't really care what the reasoning is, we're going to undo this. And then I heard the reasoning and had a play with the tree and I'm fully convinced now that when you're not just saying, how do I get every life node on the tree? And you're actually saying, what character build do I want to be? I'll get my life from items. And then the game is balanced around that. It's like twice mm. as good. But don't worry, we're not going to strip life from the passive tree and path of XL1. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, there are new defensive mechanics. I mean, like the obvious one being dodge roll. It is a active defense, I guess you could call it. Um, and you can invest into it. You can spec into it. You can make it better. Um, and that is like one example of new ways you can do that. Um, it works so well with the grand animation cancelling stuff as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll tell you, that's a tricky one. Uh, you get into the muscle memory of space barring. Then you go play POE 1 and oh, yeah. Ronnie's playing yeah. and you're like, oh, that's right. Space <laughs> bar doesn't do anything. Oh, it closes your eye. <laughs> um, you got to. You really got to get into these two mind, yeah. uh, states of mind for that one. The first half an hour of playing POE two recently was pressing spacebar to close the overlay map or whatever, and yeah. instead rolling. It, it happens for other games as well, where like you, I go, you go from this top down WASD movement games, and then you go into a, you know Path of Exile, and they ah oh, that's right, that's not how that works. Um, so it's just that you get into muscle memory and habit from playing different games, and then you. Do it. And it's the same thing here when you're jumping back and forth between these, especially with that space bar. And I love to just, I wonder, I don't know why, I just find myself uh, logging in, running around town, just spamming space bar <laughs> everywhere I'm running, just <laughs> dodge rolling. It feels faster than running, but it's exactly the same speed. Exactly right? same. Yeah, I actually took my phone out and I timed it. Yeah, I, I walked yeah. between one area and then I, I dodge rolled between one area and I was like, oh, it really is the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it felt really good. There was, I don't remember which boss it was. It was always the Huntress, because I just I absolutely fell in love with her. But there was one boss that do- it felt like the boss was designed, how do we make dodge roll feel the best mm. in, in the entire encounter? And just like every move was just telegraphed. Sorry, I'm just gushing about it. But yeah, like every move was just perfectly telegraphed. And I, I, I know people hate this comparison sometimes, but I'm a huge Dark Souls fan. And it felt like it rewarded me for starting to really learn those patterns, dodge all of them. And then it, I had really huge opportunities for applying maim, applying puncture, and just everything just lined up so perfectly. So, yeah, that just I, I like the dodge roll you a lot. You would possibly be surprised about how much of that just comes together without even trying. Hmm. Like, we don't even look at it and go, like, we do all the animations, we do the fight, we put it all together, and then we do it while dodge rolling. But we didn't, we didn't go, like, here's how long the animation needs to be and here's how long the telegraph needs to be because of dodge roll. Um, it often, like, I'd say there's like an 80% of the time, we just do it to what we feel right without any consideration for dodge roll, and then it happens to be, it just works perfectly, which is kind of cool. It just means that it just, it's just one of those kind of subtle wins that just happen to just come by without, you know. But then there are cases, obviously, where uh, it does. We uh, have timed it. So uh, an example, I guess, um, one of the, I don't know if you fought the pirate boss in Act 4 at all. No, I did not get very far in Act yeah, 4. He summons, <laughs> he summons a big anchor from the... Okay. So it renders a uh, uh, kind of ghost, flamey looking circle, and then a big anchor comes down and smashes down. That one specifically we had timed with Dodge Roll in mind. Um, i trying to think if there were any others, many other uh, obvious ones. There were not coming to mind immediately, but... Um, yeah, some are, and then a lot of them melee and monsters swinging and doing stuff like that. It's uh, it just comes together quite naturally. I love the way you can dodge roll between the legs of some monsters. Oh yeah, that's fun. That is fun. I I, I spoke that, about that in my boss talk, but the um, in POE one everything has a central hitbox. Mm-hmm. Um, so everything's a big cube, right? Yeah, everything's just a square. Um, and our grid is a square. The whole all the ground is just a square grid, right? That's how it all works. And um, um, mostly for pathfinding, we cannot have things larger than a certain size. 
so object size five we call it, and um, projectiles have the same thing. An ob a projectile cannot be larger than object size five. Um, these are technical and I believe mostly performance limitations. And uh, but then you said, like, "Oh, how does Catawba work?" That's, That's exactly what I was just going to ask. It <laughs> doesn't move, so they're allowed to be big if they cannot pathfind. Oh, okay. And he he, he animates, but he never moves off the spot. Um, Arakali is the same. She recedes down and then teleports and comes back up, but she never pathfinds. Now her death animation moves to the center, but it's animated to move to the center. There's no actual pathfinding going on. And um, we added the concept of sub-objects, server-side sub-objects, I should say. Yeah. And um, so we added the concept of server-side sub-objects. And uh, what we can do is effectively have, they can turn on and off. So for example, <laughs> I can, um, if just simulating Katava a little bit when he buries his hand on the ground, we can then turn on the sub-object sub and now you can damage it. And then when he brings his arm back up, it's no longer there, can't be damaged. This is not something we had before, but yes, it means that objects uh, don't need to have central hit boxes because we can just turn that off and instead the, both their legs can, they are, whatever limbs. There's, there's some, some monsters have like 50 different limbs, so it's hard to name what they are, but uh, ultimately, yes, you can hit different parts of the bosses or different parts of the monsters and it means you can dodge roll through things. And we're trying to make the physics feel a lot more realistic. Like things have collision when they should and don't have collision when they shouldn't. Um, whereas like, Yes, a lot in, in Perry 1, for example, you have, uh, we, we struggle with quadrupeds. And um, so you have like the, you know, just the, the beast monsters, the bears, the ones in like Act 2. Um, they're quite long, but the object size is quite small because it can't be larger than five. I mean, they're a rectangle, if you were to look at it, or an oval, if you want to look at it from like a top-down perspective. Um, but and then we have to make them a square. And so what you will find, and it's hard to notice uh, a lot of the time, is that if you then went up to melee it, you'd actually, you'd intersect with it quite far, um, especially on its front and back. Mm -hmm. But on the sides, it'd probably be about right. So um, this, now that we have a lot more close range, intimate melee going on in POE 2, where you actually are in their face doing, you know, like armor break is a good example. Yeah, you step forward into it. We don't want you to like step forward and then you're just like intersecting with the monster, um, trying to hit its center. So for larger monsters, we give them different sub objects at different positions with different sizes. And it just all makes it feel a lot more like there's a lot more collision, a lot more physics. And, you know, it, it, it makes it just feel a lot more realistic uh, in, a, in a good way. And that's more like and more visceral, I guess, is another way. Um, the other thing we have, which I hadn't actually spoken about as as well as this thing called pushy mode okay an interesting uh name but um what happens now is if you have a this is all all kind of tangential to melee but it is what makes it feel very uh grounded is this pushy mode concept is a monster can have it we give them a size and we or a pushy size and it's kind of like i guess their momentum their mass it kind of takes all that into account and um and if they kind of, uh, if they were to increase velocity, we could increase their pushy size um, because they would, like, a big monster before, you'd have a small monster and you'd have a big monster just pathfinding into it, even if it was faster. So let's say you had a, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of good examples in Perry 1, but you'd have a swarm of little monsters chasing you and you just have a bunch of bigger monsters like, I want to get by and I can't. And, like they're not going to pathfind all the way around the pack. They're just, everything's trying to get to you. Or they are constantly all trying to pathfind, but they'll just be getting blocked. Mm -hmm. Now that big monster is just going to be like, get out of the way. And they all just get <laughs> pushed to the side. Um, the first area in Act 2 does do that. You know, there's the bigger maggot zombies and then the smaller ones, the one in the Huntress demo. Mm -hmm. And those big ones just trample over the other ones and push them all to the side. They will just, they're going to get to you. Um, I think the hyenas probably do. I was going well, to mention the hyenas. Mention the hyenas ones. Yeah. Yep. Um, and because of this, we're applying the size to everything. Uh, when something is charging, we increase the size. And then when they stop, we decrease the size. So when they're charging, they have more momentum. They'll be more likely to push stuff out of the way. Um, and of course, this applies to even you and tiny monsters. So uh, with, for example, dodge roll, like if there is a smaller monster and you roll, you're not going to get stuck on that. Let's say you're completely surrounded. You cannot pathfind out. Dodge roll does pathfind. Um, 
interestingly, it didn't in the keynote because uh, we didn't have that update in because we were working on a stable build. Mm. Fun fact. So that point where Jonathan... Excuse Kowitz, for why you might have died, maybe? No, <laughs> not at all unrelated. But that one point where Jonathan's like, we've even made it so you don't get stuck on things. And I dodge roll and immediately got stuck on something. Not a, not a current problem. <laughs> um, it was funny, though. Um, so, yeah, when you're dodge rolling, we can have it that you're like, well, you're increased in momentum temporarily, right? So if you're surrounded by small monsters, it'll push them out of the way and you're fine. If you're surrounded by large monsters, you're not going to be able to move them. Um, but yes, it applies to it applies to monsters as well, where they get different levels of pushy and they move things out of the way. And it, it creates this kind of cool thing where, um, again, it all just feels a little bit more realistic. You don't just have these big mobs just going like, oh, I can't move because there's a tiny little bug in front of me. And... Um, the way we've solved this a lot in the past is by giving things phasing and it just makes everything feel so like ephemeral and yeah, it's just artificial and it's not great. Mm. So this whole pushy system is kind of cool and making things feel a lot better and um, even different player skills will have different pushy values like uh, the whirling charge on the monk, the whirling assault, um, I can't remember if that's the final name we went with, uh, has increased pushy during that so you're pushing stuff out of the way as you're doing it. But if you were to like try and push like crew tog that giant at the end of one of those goblin arenas, oh, obviously that's not going to happen. Knockback, different mechanic entirely. These pushy knockback separate. Anyway, bit of a rant. Okay, yeah. I mean that's defense and path of exile too. Yeah. <laughs> that's the question. No, that's great. I'm I'm hit me with everything. Uh, so yeah, I was going to go with the flip side of that. Uh, currently, offense and path of exile one. We scale pretty crazy right now. Uh, I have a Mage Blood Tornado Shot character with the Crucible Trees and all of that. How do you guys currently feel about offense in Path of Exile 1? You know, similar question, scaling in the Path of Exile 2. Also, regarding, like, borrowed power between the leagues, looking at all that, like, we had Sanctified Relics, and then we have the Crucible Trees. And, yeah, when we have those things, they feel really, really good. And, you know, I think people get a little bit of you know, they get that FOMO or they just get, they, they feel that, okay, this impending loss, but kind of knowing, at least for me, the confidence that I've been feeling pretty good league after league for a while now, it feels pretty good. Is, is, do we anticipate this as kind of a pattern? Do you feel like this pattern and the systems that you have in place right now are kind of heading off any sort of like 315 event and like feel like our current power and, and that scaling is, is in a good place right now? In the past, our philosophy was try to make stuff core as much as possible, pile the game full of content, because a bigger game is better. And it's because people liked systems, we leave them in generally, right? You know, you you get to keep talismans, you get to just have those forever, and any stuff we release in a, you know, that's that's the first of the expansions that started to have its own unique reward arc, which is why I use it as the first example. I understand the power level of talismans. It's very <laughs> low by current levels. But basically, every one of the things that we had would, you know, like catalysts and you know um, anointments and that kind of stuff would just all get piled into the game and you get more and more of these and that's good but they all add a small amount of um, incremental power gain compared to the previous league they let you juice your mods up slightly more they let you do a bit more damage they let you progress a bit more quickly and it got to the point with you know the 315 situation where we you know looked at the power creep and said we need to do something about hitting off some of this and that was received poorly because, you know, people don't like to lose something they have. Fair mm -hmm. enough, and we've heard that. And so we've been making a bit more of an intentional decision recently to be conscious of what power creep we cumulatively merge into the base game. And so as with Sanctified Relics and Crucible Trees, um, you can have them for the League, and we may find a way to bring them back later, but we don't want to just stack them all up on top of each other. Otherwise, the issue with Path of X are both becoming somewhat complicated and unapproachable and literally melting server hardware. No, I shouldn't say literally. That's not true. <laughs> I have seen fire. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, that um, starts to become a problem, and that's why we're being careful to swap things out. Having said that, you know, there's still continued power gain in Path of Exile will have one happening league by league, and we do try to make things core. We're just careful. There's certain things like recombinators where if we just frivolously made them core, then it would be of a similar impact to when we um, brought Harvest core without due consideration for the consequences. I am. I certainly am a huge fan of people becoming exceptionally powerful, and of course, you see this because I then, well, I we we end up adding, you know, higher tier pinnacle bosses, and we just creep the content difficulty. Um, but it does result in a situation where, like, 
Mm, it's hard to say, but it feels like uh, it requires. This is probably just a me, to me thing as well. I wouldn't say I'm kind of just thinking about this as we go, but it re probably requires too much. Uh, how do I word this? Like, it's too difficult. No, that's not the right word either. I guess what I'm trying to get at is it's too hard for people, for a lot of people, to get to the point where they can even now give any of this content even a go. Mm -hmm. Like, you need to effectively have a PhD in order to, or I guess this is where Build Guides and Ninja comes in, or you just you have guys give me a job on. by this complexity, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but figuring out that stuff yeah. like of your own volition is just so difficult now. And that's cool because the complexity is good. Like, never mistake anything like this of me. I want less complexity. I love it. I absolutely love it, right? That was my whole thing back when. Um, and... It's just, I feel like we've created this gap where you've got like tier 16 map boss with 10 million HP and then you've got your uber pinnacles and I feel like the differential in just sheer life values is just outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking like 10 million HP to, uh, I mean, what are we, we're in, I mean, are we in base, like non-player scale billions now? We might even be close to that, right? Like, we're certainly in the hundreds of millions. So you've got this just absolute extreme multiplier between those. And I'm just looking at it going like, well, player power is relative to monster life, monster difficulty, right? Those things are the same. Like, you, you could be weaker and they could be less. And you would still feel as powerful because you're just destroying them. But that would mean you're weaker than what you were yesterday. Even if the monster is proportionately weaker than they, what they were yesterday, it would still feel bad. And so there's this difficulty where you can't go backwards at all, even in that regard. Yet on the same scale, we're literally at like, you know, int max levels of life going on and levels of degen and like you, you're hitting these just walls of like, how do we even make this work anymore? Like, how do we, we can't give it more life. It's like, it and, then, fit in the number. and then like, you can't just give it damage mitigation because obviously that affects leech and everything. So you give it a kind of like, what are you, what are you supposed to do? A hidden damage mitigation where mm. it doesn't affect all that stuff. And so you'd start getting into these weird problems that we never had to encounter before because we could just keep adding more and more power. And we have hit that point. Like there have obviously been those builds where you're playing poison and all of a sudden your damage wraps around. And so it stops dealing, you, you, you get so many poisons, it stops dealing damage. And then the damage ramps back up because it goes all the way to negative, back to zero, back all the way through to positive, probably, I guess, 2.1 billion damage per minute, I believe. And then at some point it was changed to be like more, uh, instead of per minute, it was per some other magnitude. And, you know, that alleviated it for a while and then it didn't even take like three months. It probably took only another month and people are back there, you know, because they just found some new trick. And so yeah. you start getting into these weird situations where like sometimes the intention isn't to just make people uh, weaker. It's not. It, in fact, it's rarely to make uh, things weaker. It's to just create that little bit more space so that we can allow either more people but not the, the top, top people to become stronger, or we can add higher difficulty content without it just being absolutely like, you know, like completely capped out. And, you know, you could say, I say difficulty and you could say, well, more life isn't more difficult, but, you know, in the same sense, like there is a correlation there. There's some <laughs> softs and rages in there too. Yes. So, uh, I mean, and that's where I have to, yes, we do have to start kind of thinking about those mechanics on that level as well. But, I mean, ultimately, end of the day, the intention's never really to just flat out nerf things for no reason, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're we're just trying to create space if we do do it, or to have it that well. You can look at it from the other perspective of you nerf X so that a much great like so that Y, which being ten X, is now all comparatively buffed. But of course, everyone playing X feels worse and everyone feeling Y doesn't feel better. And so even though you have created a flatter, here are all these builds that are now viable and this one build is still viable but less viable, 
and if it was a much better playing field, no one felt good about it. Mm -hmm. And, or I say no one, it's an extreme. You know, some people. A lot of the people are playing for version. Yeah, I know, but I'm speaking in lots of (laughs) general sense. Yeah, yeah. That is what happens, and (laughs) we have created space, and that's cool. We've created more room for us to add more cool content and change things. Yet we've we've kind of pleased as little people as possible. And that is honestly the ultimate struggle with balancing anything, that are trying to find out how exactly to make people feel good, make the game feel good, and do the right thing, and do what we believe is the right thing as well. And it is unbelievably difficult. And I'm sure every single game company struggles with this exact, every single live service game struggles with this exact same problem. Mm -hmm. Very topical recently. Yes. Um, so regarding the complexity a little bit, it's a good segue. One of the coolest things about Path of it, is it good? I don't know if it's good, but you guys do own our souls once we get to maps. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you guys have owned my soul for like eight years now. However, I have struck like every single one of my friends, and this has been echoed by so many people, uh, that has asked me to play Path of Exile. They, I've tried every single approach to get them to play the game. And I, I want everyone to play the game. And I think it's, you know, obviously it's not for everyone, but I think there's a, there is a subset of folks that could love the game if we could figure out the right way to, to onboard them somehow. I have a weird suggestion here. Okay. Which is going to like inadvertently confirm a thing that isn't even true, but okay. um, I'm going to suggest Ruthless. And I'm not saying that because I'm a big Ruthless <laughs> shell, right? That's the inadvertently confirming the thing that everyone thinks. But <laughs> yeah. it's simplified enough and slower enough that it actually works incredibly well for onboarding noobs. Like, I have friends who aren't good at games, and and I'm not talking about my girlfriend who loves Ruthless, just to be very clear. Um, I'm, I have friends who aren't very good at games who have not been able to get on Path of Exile in the, you know, 16 and a half years I've been working on it. They've played every single version and haven't got it very far, but it got really far in Ruthless because it's just quite a lot simpler and the combat and stuff is slower paced and the progression is a bit slower and there's less of a whole, I have to be getting that PhD while I'm playing. And then, of course, you can graduate from Ruthless to the slightly uh, more complicated version of the game that actually has you know 50 crafting mechanics you have to understand to make your items correct and all the stuff you have to stack. So while Ruthless was marketed as this is much over hardcore and it's so difficult and can you handle it? The reality is it's kind of Path of Exile for beginners and then the hard one is the one that requires the PhD. I can actually confirm that. One of my best friends who started playing before me, he was in closed beta, he had always got overwhelmed between me and my other friends kind of having conversations about crafting or our economic strategies midterm. And he actually very much fell in love with Ruthless. And he, he just he gets to red maps by the end of an entire league, and he's very happy. And uh, yeah, I, I totally buy that. However, I'm trying to figure out how to word this properly. Some way to even, I, I know about the, the help page and putting, mm. putting work into something that no one's using, and I, I totally buy that. But some sort of onboarding resource that's mm. not just content creators in the game, uh, like I just, I would love more people to be able to play. If we can solve that, yeah, I now, know it's hard. So part of it is correct introduction of mechanics, right? Path of Exile does not do a particularly good job of onboarding you to the stuff in a slow, gradual, meaningful way, right? And we kind of we tried our best, but it's hard. POE two is doing a better job of that. We get the ability to, with many years of hindsight, actually have a think about how we want to onboard stuff. And an example of a thing, for example, that I know we're doing better in POE 2 is there comes a point for any new player paying POE 1 without assistance where they hit that thing to do with your skill gems going in the items and you want to swap an item, and that suddenly means you have to get the same socket colors somewhere else on your character. And it's that wall of like, oh, I see, I have to, okay, um, how am I going to do this? What, what currency do I have? I have three jewelers, what do they do? And you know what I mean? There's a bit of a wall there. And it even affects existing players who are trying to, you know, high-level players who are trying to swap items. So in Path of Exile 2, that problem just doesn't exist. And that means that it's significantly easier to onboard someone into both the skill system and the item system because they both just operate independently of each other and make their own separate sense. You're not stuck having to take your equipment you want to use off for another one because of sockets. And you're also not stuck having to drop a skill because you want to wear different boots with move speed. And that's helping make it more onboardable by taking this horrible wall out of the way. Mm. Honestly, this question plagues me every day. Like, making things more approachable is, without making anything less complex, is mm. something I would love to achieve. Yeah. And I honestly don't know how to do it the right way. 
Um, we have a hundred times in the development of Peary 2 hit things where there's such an easy change to make that would slightly reduce the depth of something compared to Path of Exile 1. And we feel that is a death knell of a sequel. If the players can say, you've dumbed it down, mm-hmm. then it's dead, right? No one will get behind it. And so we have made sure that not a thing has been dumbed down. Everything is as deep or deeper than the original game. And the onboarding would be so much easier to solve if we could dumb down anything. But we're not going to. That's not what we do. Okay. All right. I'm very excited to get some of my friends. They know. Some of my friends that uh, they've I, been bouncing off. I watched off. a video yeah. the other day. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what it was by, which is that uh, it the game seems more complicated than it really is. Mm-hmm. If you just play and just click, do what you're doing, you'll probably have a reasonably fun time. Well, hopefully a very fun time, <laughs> you know. Um, if you start looking into what everything does and trying to, and thinking you need to know it all, Mm-hmm. then you will overwhelm yourself very, very quickly and scare yourself. And and then because you will now believe that unless you know these things, that you're at a disadvantage, which could or could not be true, uh, you'll probably uh, terrify yourself out of playing. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you just kind of play and just go with the flow, mm-hmm. you probably have, you should hopefully have a good time, assuming that it's the kind of game for that kind of personality or person. Yeah. Same is true for a lot of hobbies. Like, let's say someone wants to get into running, right? Put shoes on, go outside, done, right? But you can get into it by reading all the fitness forums and looking at the exact mile splits you've got to have and the exact cardio heart rate you've got to be in and how you're supposed to carb load beforehand and do all this stuff. And at the end of the day, it's basically a spreadsheet. And that's overwhelming, and a lot of people bail out there. But the alternative is, you know, click on the monsters or put the shoes on or whatever the analogy is, just get started and play. And it actually onboards you okay-ish, and you can worry about the carbs or path of building spreadsheet at a later time once you're more comfortable with the game but unfortunately life is about min maxing these days everyone needs to hustle with their games people's attention and and spare time are very limited you know they want their exercise to pay off immediately they want the gaming to pay off immediately and that means jumping right to the hardest thing watching the hardest guide and saying wow this is complicated it gets them there faster but a more natural approach certainly gets them there probably in a more easy way Mm -hmm. Yeah, these shoes represent like four hours of internet research. <laughs> What's the best running shoes? I totally get that. Yeah, that was actually a really cool thing. Uh, I noticed when I leveled up in Pee Mobile, when you first get introduced to the passive tree, you know, that's mm-hmm. the, the famous Path of Excel moment, um, they actually only show you the two choices. And until you select one of them, you can't zoom out and, and look at it. And I think that that, and that was a big thing that uh, I think Preach said in his mm-hmm. playthrough was there's only two choices. You know, just if you make, just understand that there's only two choices right now, uh, don't get overwhelmed. It's not that big of a deal. Stay zoomed in initially. We've experimented internally with us in Path of Exile one ages ago and found that when many players are presented with just choose between A and B, they say, I know there's a big passive tree. You're hiding it. What are you doing? Where is it on Google? I found it. Oh God, this is complicated. Why isn't this in the game plant? You know? <laughs> And so it is tricky. It makes a lot of sense for mobile because we are targeting a wider audience there. Obviously, the game is still as deep as possible, but there are things we're doing there that we would um, be more careful before doing in Path of Exile 2, for sure. Mm -hmm. There's less of a direct comparison, I guess. Now, what would you guys say to to bring it back to philosophy in Path of Exile 1 and 2 a little bit? I actually love that uh, Neon said that he likes a lot of power, and that's obviously a concern that people play. But... uh, could we, are, should we expect a different power level initially? I mean, obviously, we're very far away. Um, but, you know, can we get that Enigma Frozen Orb? Like, it feels like that's kind of what we're going for in Path of Exile 1. And Path of Exile 2, are we thinking just like hammered in? Or what kind of, what kind of... I would say my primary restriction on power, if you want to call it that, is simply I do not want it to be that, which comes back to visual clarity. You should be able to see what is happening. You should be able to see what monsters are doing. You should be able to see what your character is doing. And it shouldn't just be, I watched a video yesterday. I don't know, maybe you showed me it. And it's just, what I was like, what am I looking at? And it's just colors and teleporting. And that is even still kind of- That's not the egregious one. That's still kind of fine if it's very, very rare and very, very out there, but everything is just, too fast for for your 
brain to even be it's able like, to process what's going on. It's like one attack a second feels slow, two attacks feels better, three feels kind of good, four feels great, five, you know, it carries on. Ten, we can have a game with ten attacks a second, but four thousand somehow? Like, there has to be a line. It's like setting a speed limit at 300 kilometers an hour on the roads, right? You know, if you're if you've somehow built a 2,000 kilometer an hour super machine, then you are annoyed at us, but you know, the the average like gameplay will still I'm like well just don't you want to be able to see what killed you? Don't you want to be able to like understand what killed you? Like I know people are asking for death logs, but isn't that because the cause is yielding the request for that problem? And like that's where I believe it becomes an issue. Mm-hmm. Um I want it to be hard, I want it to you to be powerful, I want you to it to be I want you to be able to overcome that difficulty with gear. I want you to be able to become good at the game, a hundred percent, all of that. Like I love doing that. I mean, that's my whole thing. I want you to be able to find ways to create builds of the week, like I did way back when. And all of a sudden, now everything just feels kind of easy because you've learned all this and accomplished it. But you, I at least want it to be that you can comprehend what is even happening. Mark is um, in charge of this, and he is Mr. Power Fantasy in terms of wanting characters to feel good. So, like, any punchiness in Path of Exile 1 is directly because of Mark, and he is in charge of Path of Exile 2 in this way. Yeah, so like, don't get me wrong, like, the power people have is a direct resultant of... A direct me. choice of you. As well. Yeah, a resultant and a choice, yes. Yeah. Um, but it is certainly the case that it is very easy to get to the point now, very easy, I should say. Again, I'm not wanting it to be impossible but it is very easy to get to the point where you can no longer tell what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I experience this a lot going back to the approachability with other people witnessing the game and they're just like, "Uh, what am I looking at here? I don't like, it's, it's just, you want power without it feeling like it is super frantic, I guess, and more like overly accelerated. And that is, you know, hard to achieve because a good way to scale power is to scale speed, right? It doesn't, like, you could scale power only through damage and then you're just moving at the same velocity the whole time and that's nowhere near as fun. Of course, you don't want that, right? So you want a bit of both, but it certainly feels like the speed is at the top, top end out of control. And this is not for the average player. The average player is nowhere near going at this, I'm talking about like very, very, very top end levels of, of, of power, power, speed, I don't know, the, the, the words get a little bit conflated. Prior to ExileCon, we're obviously aware that we're showcasing some methodical, clear demonstrations of how combat works in a combinatorial way, showing off all the different skills, and it's not fast, right? Like, we know the players are going to watch it and say, but where are my zooms, right? And sure, we're showing combat in Act 3 here, you know, you're not zooming that hard by Act 3, and you certainly can be going fast if you choose to by this point, if you build your character that way. But we had the question of, do we find some zoomy combat, some insane Path of Exile stuff? and show it at ExileCon. And we looked into this. We started to make characters. We wrote a script. And the problem was, because we are still the better part of a year away from release, we don't want to misrepresent it. Where we pick a level now, hastily, two days before ExileCon, to reassure people that they're getting the power they want, and then are committed to hitting exactly their level. What if we actually wanted to be a bit higher? What if we wanted to be a bit less? And so we're going to take the time to make sure we've worked out where Path of Exile's endgame power level is at, and then showcase it with something that's actually accurate and reassuring. And we don't think players are going to be disappointed there. The last couple of questions. One of my favorite things about the approach of Path of Exile that I think very, very few games actually have is the sandbox approach of we're going to throw things in that might just objectively be kind of bad right now. In two years, there's mm-hmm. going to be some combination of like, oh, I can run this alternate quality haste with Wilma's Requital. Speaking of lack of visual clarity, that's the thing I did last league. And crazy interactions just happen. At the time of the inception of that item or that mechanic or at the time of like a player discovering it or something happening at a league you know some league mechanic how much of that would you say is intentional are you surprised sometimes when something doesn't show up for like a year and you're like i can't believe players didn't find it right away or i that that's just one of my favorite things and like how much of that is actually intentional we plant a lot of seeds and we wait for them to grow and there are so many things in the game that are just bad because they haven't grown and will one day combine with something. Um, Mark, you're putting stuff in all the time. We that's... most of what get of the uh, really cool things that get discovered are not foreseen. Mm. Like to be perfectly honest, there are things we add and we're like, look, look some, this is going to cause something. 
but we can't say what that something is because we don't know but we're like this is cool we should add it like we um it's it's planting the seeds for sure but we don't know what we what seed we planted it lets the community make the content later when they essentially get to make a build out of nowhere now the tricky thing is we can't predict where the power level of that's going to end up and so a thing we face in path of xl1 is we plant all these crazy seeds that combine in crazy ways and later on they're too powerful and meta distorting and then a nerf is necessary or some adjustment. And that's because we just put effects out there and wait for them to be combined together when we can't really predict how it's going to be. Having said that, many of the coolest builds are using things like this. You know, like, you know, Ward Loop is an example where we didn't expect, like if you'd said, if you'd have pinned Mark down beforehand and said exactly what are they going to do with Ward, he'd have said something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love, I love all the discoveries. And I love discovering them myself, right? But, you know, you're talking about many hundreds of thousands of people you know, getting to look at these things once it goes live versus a dozen internally or two dozen internally. It's like you're never going to find all these things. And that's fine. That's the beauty of Path of Exile. That is, exactly. I, and it's really cool. I love it. Yeah. Right? Like, and we're directly inspired by Magic the Gathering there. They print some weird cards occasionally and then wait. You know, Helm of Obedience is a perfect example, but I won't go into the analogy in too deep a way. <laughs> now, I loved used to trying to hunt the broken mechanics and the things that interact, and I loved trying to find things that people hadn't done before. And like when I originally was like, I'm talking way back when, like before I even worked here, a good over a decade ago, that was just that was one of the things that made me love Path of Exile the most. Basically, so. got hired by a build of the week, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, because you liked it. Yeah. So now you run the game. <laughs> That's actually so, yeah. a perfect segue to my final question. Uh, what is your guys' favorite builds of all time? It's a dumb answer because it, it just, it, but it's just so core to my past of this game, and it's not even a complex build. But it was just my silly freeze mining that got me a bunch of hate from a bunch of people and a bunch of you know it was. The old freeze mine prolif. It's not like there was any complexity. You literally use freeze mine with prolif, and you just freeze normal rarity monsters with the proliferating freeze, and it would freeze every boss. So you always just pull, you pull random like white mobs next to the unique monster, and you just freeze them, and then you just have someone unequip all the AOE and just single target down the boss. You know, like it. Um, it was borderline exploitative from an outsider perspective, but it was kind of like, well, I mean, look, that's how it works. Like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> You know, it wasn't bugged, it wasn't anything, and then there, it caused all kinds of uh, kind of ethical debates about whether or not I should be doing that, and uh, as a staff member, I'm promoting exploitation, because I was playing with people on stream quite frequently back then. Um, so it, even though the build isn't like some crazy thing I discovered, no one was doing it because Freeze Mine dealt no damage. No one used it. Like, it was deemed worthless. And then I was like, well... I mean, is it? And now, much like you have an Aura Guardian running, or a, you know, a, a Aura Bot running in all the high-end efficient parties right now, back then you'd have your Freeze Miner. It was, you're probably just running a two-link Freeze Miner in Prolif. You don't even need the other gems. And, you know, it's just... It, it holds a special place, you know, even though nothing complicated about it whatsoever. It was just this thing of a, a worthless skill being now deemed exploitable. And then we have to nerf freeze mine. Like no one would have ever had thought of that being a thing in like those words would not have been put together before that time. So Well we were just talking about nerfing cast on death over the weekend. So. Yeah, well sure. Again? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Did you hear about that interaction though? No. So during uh the trial of the Ancestors League, um if you die, die in the match. In the match, you don't actually die because oh, because the you come back to life. Yeah, like that whole kind of cooldown. So you can you just, just run over some death, and death, and then you respawn. Yeah, why not? It becomes completely so you can something. Just something nuke them. Up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All um, right. And it's just like all of a sudden now another just you know support gem that has very very niche use cases. You're like, well, actually, this this you know create some more inspiration as to how it can be used in real interesting ways. It's real cool. It's I, Even when Andrew said that on stage the other day, I was like, oh, yo, I like that. I really like that. <laughs> it's very yeah. Path of Exile. Finally, it's huge. Yeah, it's cool. 
Um, this is going to be a really boring answer, but my favorite build that I have played is a really vanilla Molten Strike Dragonaut that I put together myself a long time ago where I waded into the monsters and Molten Strike them to death and it felt good and it felt like I was actually hitting them and they died and I found, found good items and it was in hardcore and I didn't die. And it just was a good experience, you know, and that's the one that I, I preferred over net decking with other people's build guides where I just follow it. Like, my most powerful character would have been a recent Righteous Fire one. Cool. Mm-hmm. But the credit goes to the people that put that together, right? Um, I just liked my Marauder because he was working well and I was killing monsters and melee felt good for me there and I had the right attack speed to feel good and, you know, had a good time. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much, guys. You're welcome. This, it's been great. This was more than I could ask for. This was great. Thanks for the good questions. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Well, I guess that concludes our interview. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Thank you. Awesome. All right, that's it. That was the interview. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you everyone for, you know, helping to grow this community and get us down there to New Zealand. And yeah, I two years ago, if you asked me, there's no world where I would be sitting in a room and interviewing Chris and Mark. The support of all you guys, everyone subscribing, Patreons, everything, you guys just being here. It's like a very big milestone <laughs> in, in my life and my career. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to remember that forever. So yeah, thank you so much, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed watching. I'm so excited for 3.22 in Path of Exile 2. That interview for me especially assuaged a lot of my, you know, kind of doubts just knowing that, yay, that we got some good, smart people. You know, we already knew this, <laughs> but, you know, they thought about a lot of the stuff that, you know, might we might be worrying about. And yeah, I'm just so excited for it. And yeah, we have a lot of great stuff coming in the future. So yeah, I'm gonna go get ready for the stream. Hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see y'all soon. Goodbye.